One of the very difficult concepts in the history of Jewish theology is that of Tzimtzum. And with me to explore it and how it's influencing her own research is Professor Agatha Bede Grubson. Agatha, it's one of those really dreadful concepts to try and describe, but I'm going to ask you. Even pronounce. Even pronounce. <laughs> okay. Tzimtzum uh, is the term uh, which seems obscure uh, because it belongs to a theosophic, to the theosophic tradition of uh, uh, Jewish thought, most of all Kabbalah, although it has earlier antecedents uh, uh, already in uh, midrashes. Uh, uh, but it's actually incredibly important uh, because it was the seemingly obscure concept that. Uh, arose within the lore of uh, uh, um, Palestinian Kabbalah uh, in the thought of Isaac Luria in 16th century, uh, subsequently to influence practically the whole of modern thought. Um, I'm now at uh, the point of completion uh, of uh, the anthology of texts. Um, uh, which uh, uh, are all devoted to the mm. aftermaths or afterlives of uh, the concept of Tim Tsum and of course in it, modernity and basically show that this, again, seemingly very obscure and enigmatic notion uh, uh, um, created by Isaac Luria can be found everywhere, in Isaac Newton, in Leibniz, in German idealism, in Schelling, in Hegel, in Christian Kabbalah, in the Pietists, uh, in uh, German mystics. Okay, okay. Let's, let's up to the usual suspects of the Jewish thought in the 20th century, obviously Derrida, Hans Jonas, Adorno, Bloch, etc. Okay, well et let's, what we'll do is, let's start with, let's, let's try and just get the influence in three. This is, Tzimtzum is actually sometimes called Lurianic mysticism. Yes. Because a, that's another bit of jargon out there, and we'll, we'll just try and tie it down. OK, how about Newton, the Pietus, and say Hans Jonas? Because we don't think of, we don't think of, of Isaac Newton as, we think of him as a scientist, not a religious thinker. We think of the Pietus as characteristically Christian, mm -hmm. and then Hans Jonas as a modern Jewish thinker. So, Tzimtzum in and its influence Indeed. on, on, okay. on, on yes. Newton. Well, first of all, uh, the definition of uh, Tzimtzum. Uh, it means in Hebrew, God's contraction, withdrawal, retreat. Uh, it sometimes points to a voluntary action uh, in which God wi uh, retreats into his circumference in order to make a room within himself for something else. Mm. Uh, the best way to approach Tzimtzum is to quote Shalem, who basically paraphrases uh, the Bereshit, the first lines of the Hebrew Bible, by saying, in Luria, in the beginning, God creates nothing. So uh, God does not create the world directly out of himself out of the simple presence of the substance which is in him, he first creates nothingness in order to make an empty room, a space that is marked by radical separation uh, between it and the God, and only into this emptiness sends the rays of emanation, which then form the bud of the future world. Uh, but the story is actually even more dramatic because uh, these rays of emanation, uh, emanating strong divine light, uh, they meet the forms that are prepared for them there, the so-called vessels. But because there is already a separation between God and this emptiness, they are tinged with nothingness. So they cannot withstand the force of this light, so they break. So we have this moment of Shvirat Hakelim, the breaking of the vessels, and the issuing world is actually kind of a chaos of mixture of form and matter, of um, 
the sparks and the shards. Mm. Uh, but mm. in the end, what happens in the end of this whole dramatic theosophic story is that the world emerges as something radically other to God, radically other, sharing only elements of the dispersed light, but absolutely discontinuous with the divine origin. And this is this idea, so theologically new, innovative and strange, that actually uh, proved to be, uh, to be at so attractive uh, to many modern thinkers, eager to break with the traditional idea of uh, the relationship between world and God. That is, God imagined as the absolute, maintaining the world continuously in existence via creatio continua. Modernity wanted to break with this image of the, uh, of the world as sustained within uh, a God's existence, and hence Isaac Newton. Okay, get back to Newton. The first deist, right, mm. uh, who basically says that the world is the other, is the finished totality which has been given everything it needs in order to sustain itself in existence, all the laws, all the forces, all the energies. And the God, who is indeed a creator of all this, has withdrawn from an active participation in, in uh, uh, the world. So deism, uh, which talks about God's withdrawal, is actually a, a kind of a cooler, less traumatic, but still a philosophical version of, uh, of Isaac's glorious vision of Tzimtzum. So in, it's a little bit like when Napoleon meets Laplace, and Napoleon asks the question, where is God in this system? And we don't said, need this hypothesis. Exactly. Mm. Well, in a way we do, and this is uh, where Hans Jonas comes in the picture, um, uh, where he says that uh, this is a hypothesis of the Godhead. He doesn't even call it a God in a personal sense, of the Godhead, which in times immemorial, unfordenklich, unfordenklich past, immemorial uh, uh, mm. past, has given itself over to hazard and risk, uh, the process of becoming. Uh, for Jonas, we still need this hypothesis, but in a vestigial form that only refers to this long gone origins of the first withdrawal of God that created the space of a new kind of being called becoming. Um, but for Jonas, we still need this hypothesis because it also orients us towards the possible metaphysical future of the world. This is drawing on Luria's mystical or messianic idea that the world, okay, is created as radically other to God's uh, mode of being, but it also is charged with an obligation to put itself in order that is to recreate the divine face, but then within the immanence. So it is somehow a secret obligation of the world, a secret moral, religious duty to pursue the messianic path of this immanentist recreation of God's face. You've shown us this, you've shown us this influence of Luria on Isaac Newton and Jonas. But in between, you mentioned the pietists. And while one would, can expect it to a certain extent in, in, in someone like Isaac Newton and in Hans Jonas, it seems odd. Odd, <laughs> yes. It's far less what we would expect. So how is it present in the pietists? Indirectly, uh, via the so-called Christian Kabbalah, uh, which is a, a wide phenomenon uh, spreading in the 17th century uh, in Europe, uh, 
due to the um, <clears throat> translations, although they were never really like translations, but the uh, 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 translatory modifications of the parts of Lurianic doctrine in uh, Rosenrod, Kabbalah Danudata, then in the uh, so-called Kabbalah of the Rosicrucians. Uh, Kabbalah, Lurianic Kabbalah especially, uh, via the, uh, the, the Italian school of, of Luria's followers active in, uh, uh, in uh, the time of uh, Renaissance there, uh, become, became a very influential, important part of the esoteric law, lore of early modern uh, Europe and m uh, quite a lot of uh, mystical, mystically minded uh, or theosophically minded Christians uh, were already steeped in it. And um, the so-called Christian Kabbalah uh, modified uh, the elements of the Lurianic Kabbalah in such a way so it fits the, uh, the Christian doctrine. Uh, we have, uh, uh, instead of three parts to theme, the, the personages of God, mm. we have simply three hypostases, as in the Trinity. Mm. Uh, we have God the Father, we have Logos as the Son, uh, which is responsible for the emanation, and finally, instead of Shekhinah, uh, that is God's dwelling on earth, we have Holy Spirit. Mm. Uh, what is very interesting about this reception of the Lurianic Kabbalah is that it indeed paves the way to the German idealism. We know that Hegel uh, read the German pietists like Oettinger and uh, the phenomenology of the spirit is in a way a philosophical sublation that is a translation of the theosophic doctrine which we can call the Christianity of the spirit. That is the Christianity which following uh, Lurianic messianism sees the main activity of, uh, of the divine already in the world in the sort of scattered, dispersed forms of individual spirits. So the uh, Christianity of the spirit which becomes very uh, important part of the German pietistic uh, tradition is then picked up by a German idealist and hence Geist, hence the spirit as the main actor of human history. Agatha, thank you very much. Thank you.